Um, thank you all for joining us. My name's Kitty, and I'm the Nature Programme Manager here at the Conservative Environment Network. Thank you for joining us for the SEND's ninth fringe event of this conference season on the topic of how we can solve England's rivers crisis. Thank you also to our sponsor, Anglian Water, for making this event possible. For those that don't know, SEN is the independent forum for conservatives in the UK and around the world who support net zero, nature restoration and resource security. We're hosting a total of 21 public events at this year's conference, the details of which can be found on your seats, so I do hope to see you all again soon in the media suite. A brief note on the format of this event, we'll be beginning with three minutes of introductory remarks from each panellist, followed by audience questions, so have your questions ready. And do feel free to tweet along with the event using the hashtag SEN at CPC. Before handing over to the panellists, I'd just like to provide a little bit of context for today's event for those that aren't sure. Rivers are one of England's most important natural resources. Our rivers historically and currently are connecting our towns and cities and also function as spaces for vital recreation as well as essential habitats for innumerable species. However, despite their importance, earlier this year, a report into the state of our rivers led by Parliament's Environmental Audit Committee described them as a chemical cocktail of sewage, agricultural waste and plastic, and in fact only 14% of English rivers are currently in good condition. The state of our rivers has quickly become a vital issue to address in British politics. As a result of campaigning in Parliament and across the country, the Environment Act that was passed last November contains a wealth of measures to clean up our rivers, including, but not limited to, new targets for water quality, the creation of a sewage discharge reduction plan, as well as new strategic guidance for Ofwat, the new water regulator. Also, recently, as Friday, I think, of last week, the new Secretary of State announced a new measure regarding civil fines for water companies, raising them by 1,000 times. But there's still a long way to go to meet our new water quality targets and to address other pressures on rivers. And with all of this in mind, you're joining us today for the purpose of this panel, which is to consider what more can be done to, re to reverse the future of our rivers. And so, on to our panellists. The first panellist we have is Philip Dunn, MP. Philip is the MP for Ludlow. He is also chair of the Environmental Audit Committee for the report that I just mentioned, and is a very active member of SEN's Parliamentary Caucus. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Kitty, and thank you to Conser Conservative Environment Network for the fantastic job you do in keeping the environment at the top of the political agenda within the Conservative Party and within this government. Um, I did not go into politics to talk crap. My opponents, political opponents, would assume that I've been doing that ever since I got involved, but I have spent the last two and a half years campaigning to try and improve the quality of our rivers. The rivers are the arteries of nature, and with furred up arteries, we know what happens to the rest of nature, um, because we know uh, that they are so important for all of the aquatic species that, uh, that rely on, uh, on our rivers, and, and everything that we as human beings do in our rivers to enjoy our life and make people um, feel good. I have a very, very good friend who died earlier this year who wrote a book called Cancer and Pisces. Jonathan, you may have read Jonathan Aitken's um, article about him uh, in the Telegraph uh, last week. Uh, he, he, he used fishing to um, help him live for nine years longer than his doctors told him he would with the particular cancer that he had. Angling is the biggest participant sport in this country. There are over three million members of the Angling Trust. The Rivers Trust is a, and I'm sure there's somebody here from the Rivers Trust, um, is a fantastic organization now chaired by my colleague Sir Charles Walker, which exists in order to try to make our rivers better places for people and to enjoy and for creatures to live in them. We have a legacy built up as a result of the fact that we cannot see what we, um, we, the sewers that exist under the places where we live. We have been building above ground for, uh, for hundreds of years and not been building underground the, the systems that take away the effluent that we all produce every day. And that is the crux of the problem that we have, that the release valve for our sewage are our rivers. And that, is, that, that was originally established by, uh, by Bazalgette when he built the sewers under London. He recognised that we needed to uh, have somewhere to go rather than to back sewage up into the streets and our houses if there was an excess weather event. And unfortunately, uh, that presumption has, has really underpinned 
uh, the way in which our, uh, 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 the infrastructure to deal with this problem has been uh, addressed politically. It's been a problem that was out of sight, out of mind, until it's too late. It now is too late because we're, we're living with the consequences of about 60 years of um, insufficient capacity being built into uh, our on uh, above ground development. Uh, and that's something that we as conservatives have done more to address than any other previous government. Just a very quick plug for the Environment Act, which took on board a number of measures which I championed through a private member's bill, which thanks to COVID never saw the light of day. But we have, we have done more in legislation to start to solve this problem than any previous government. And do not believe any of the lies that are, and I don't use that word lightly, um, told by our political opponents about how the Conservatives are trying to address this problem. We absolutely are. And the single measure that will do most to solve this crisis uh, for the future is introducing monitoring equipment in statute, which will require that every wastewater treatment, every asset of a water company, we'll hear from, uh, from Anglian shortly, um, a, a, a treatment plant or combined sewer overflow, any outflow going into a waterway will require a monitoring device above and below uh, the, the, in, in the receiving water, which will be providing information in near real time using you know, currently available um, uh, spectrometry and other uh, testing equipment to a degree that has never been possible before. This, is, this will have to be introduced across the network over the next pricing period, which is, will take about five years to do, because there are about 20,000 of these outflow pipes. Um, and that will be available to the water company so that they know if there's been a spillage uh, that it's happened in real time, which at the moment they don't. It will be available to the regulator, the Environment Agency, which at the moment have an inspector who might turn up once a year to inspect uh, an outfall pipe or might not, because there aren't very many of them. And much more importantly, it'll be available to the public. Uh, and that means that if you want to go fishing or swimming in a patch of river, you will be able to look up whether or not they've had a spill incident within the previous period of time whereby it hasn't washed away. That will transform the ability of campaign groups to understand what's happening in their waterways, which will in turn put pressure on people like me and other local politicians and on the water companies to do something about it. And that will be the single biggest factor in transforming the quality of our waterways for the fish and other species that live there and us as human beings to enjoy. Thank you, Beth. is Anna Firth. Anna is the MP for South End West as well as a member of the Education Committee and the SEN Parliamentary Caucus and she was also before becoming an MP a member of SEN's board. Over to you Anna. Thank you very much Kitty and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to start with an immediate uh, confession. As you know I'm a new MP. I'm the MP for South End West which is a coastal community and Anglian Water are our local water company. So I am going to use this as an unashamed uh, moment to make a plea for coastal communities to be considered as a special case. And I do that uh, with these, with these um, facts in mind. And th this will be common to many other uh, coastal communities. So South End, as an example, seven miles of award-winning beaches. We host seven million visitors a year. We contribute three billion to the Exchequer. On top of that, we have a thousand-year-old fishing industry. We have internationally protected foreshores with expanding marshlands, with rare species, the Carder Bee, extremely, extremely environmental sensitive areas. We are also home to a group that some of you may have heard of called the Blue Tits Chill swimming group yeah, they yeah, yeah. they are an amazing group of ladies and there are 3000 of them living in south end so they spend no time quite rightly in bringing to my attention that last year in south end alone we had diluted raw sewage pumped into the sea 48 times for more than 250 hours that's the equivalent of 10 whole days because we are at the end of the estuary, we are exactly where the River Thames becomes the estuary, the Crowstone is in my constituency. That means we are also affected by everything else that, carry, that happens along the River Thames. 
as you will, some of you will know, last year, 39 million tonnes of diluted sewage was, tumbed, was dumped into the Thames, equivalent to 3 million London buses. That is having a disastrous effect on our environment. 98% of water sampled it by the Thames River Watch last year was found to contain traces of coliform bacteria. That shows the presence of faeces in the water. So coastal communities absolutely have to be top of the list when it comes to eliminating these damaging storm overflows. We cannot wait until 2035, albeit we completely welcome the government's uh, storm over overflow plan. It is the first plan of its nature. It groundbreaking. However, coastal communities must come first and we must have more action, not just on the plan, but also on the information. The information is now available. I shouldn't have people in my constituency having to go on the, uh, the website of Surfers Against Sewage to get information about storm overflows. That information is, is available, and I'm very pleased Anglian Water have already uh, promised me and will be explaining how they will be making that information more available in real time for swimmers. There is a lot of scaremongering. The water is not always unsafe, but unless we have the information, how are people to know about it? The RNLI has a brilliant system of flags to tell you when it's safe to swim, when the tides and the wind, etc., uh, are too strong or, or perfect. We need the same for the quality of our water. This is not rocket science. The data is there. This is just a question of good communication, and coastal communities need it first. And then the final, my final uh, plea uh, is there is something we can all do. Because let's face it, we all use the bathroom. And wet wipes uh, are behind 93% of blockages in UK sewers. They cost water companies at least £100 million to deal with, blocking, dealing with 300,000 blockages a year. And that money, of course, is currently being added to our bills. So we must all get behind campaigns to get rid of things that are going down the toilet, which are going to block, uh, block, the, block our sewers and give us a problem. Uh, when I went round at the Anglican Water Sewage Plant last week in preparation for this event, they said there's only four things that should go down the, the loo. Pee, poo, paper and puke. I think we'd all do well to stick to those four P's, and I'll, I'll end on that note. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for that reminder. Next, our panellist is <laughs> Councillor Linda Richards. Linda is a councillor in Leeds City Council representing the Weatherby Ward. She's also SENS River Ambassador and is currently leading a bathing water campaign locally, which I hope she'll now tell us a bit more about. Over to you, Linda. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the two previous speakers because you set the tone quite nicely there, I think particularly in the last four Ps. But I think the focus on the infrastructure plus the sort of the mechanisms is really where I'm at. Because as a ward councillor, um, I'm aware of the impact of all of those on the fact that we have a very beautiful river, the River Wharf, which goes through our constituency there. It starts in the Yorkshire Dales and meanders for about 81 miles, joins up with the River Ouse and becomes a fully fledged river into the sea. So it does join all of those issues. And Weatherby Town is a small market town which has developed because of that river. So it is dependent on that river as such. And what we see is that what has happened in creating that settlement there, it has reflected all the growth, the industrialisation and the pressure on the systems that exist there. So about three years ago, I became involved in the first bathing water application, which was for Ilkley. And I became enthused by that. And then as uh, I was elected in December 19, realised I was in a position to maybe do something about this. Obviously, COVID intervened. Somewhere about May, I decided that we would actually go for bathing water status, which in itself is an amazingly anachronistic term because it was devised originally in the 90s, I think, to try and deal with some of the pollution on the beaches, which was happening because, as um, has been said, the original sewage always went out to somewhere and was just got rid of. 
whereas that became evident that it was not actually working for everybody's best benefit. So the idea was that you would have this bathing water status that you would apply for, and if you look on the map, they're all carefully around the map, and they're not on the inland bathing water areas. So this is obviously a huge difficulty, because as we've said, those rivers are the artery, they are used, and they are used by a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. So um, when you look at it, though, the process is somewhat interesting because the process to achieve it is that the most important elements of achieving it are, number one, that you have public toilets, number two, that you have a car park, and number three, that you have a cafe, <laughs> right? Nothing to do with the water or anything like that. So it can be quite difficult because that actually means that a number of areas cannot apply for bathing water status because they simply don't comply with those issues in the first place. And then we come on to the process itself. You have to obviously get sub support and public consultation. So you have to have all the riparian owners, you have to have all the local businesses, you have, I've included schools, obviously all the residents, police, the fire brigade, and anybody else who knows me. It becomes a really huge logistical exercise in that way. So the most important thing, though, is the count. And the count is literally on each day counting who uses that river, how they use it, and why they use it in that way, because it can be slightly different ways. And what you find there is that you can have some conflict of interest in there. Now, the reason I say this laughingly at this point is that I am going not just for one bathing water status, but three on this river, is that there are three very distinct areas of usage in that way. We have one area that you might call a beach, children paddle, people enjoy the view, people have their picnics. Around the bend, because it's an oxbow bend, you have an area that is paddleboarders, swimmers. It's by the leisure centre. Very different usage in that way. And then further upstream, you have another area linked to a weir and has a combination. Across all of this, you have the anglers. So somewhere you have to try and balance all these differing needs and differing approaches to their use of the river. So that in turn means that what you are doing is informing a lot of people about the river itself. You have to do all this between May the 15th and May the 30th, uh, sorry, September the 30th in any given year. There have to be 10 days of which are either public holidays or school holidays at a weekend. And you have to get all that in, as I say, by, May, by September the 30th to be delivered by October the 31st. So at the moment, my house is the repository of an enormous amount of information, which is absolutely brilliant. Because we've had, I reckon now, about a thousand public responses to this uh, episode. And I think that is a real indication of how important this is viewed by so many different elements of our residential community. So we all know that there are huge ups and huge downs in this. And if we are going to look at the ways in which it's already been referred to about how we need to improve matters, I would say, firstly, it's enforcement, which comes on the back of monitoring. I would say it's investment, which comes on the back of also monitoring, but let's face it, finance. And I would actually say you need to make it a little bit easier for people to actually do this process of monitoring their river and making it more accessible to everyone. So I would just like to say a huge thank you, starting off a plug for CEN, because their bathing water toolkit, which I have at the back and which I've used on the innumerable road shows that I have done around my town and five villages that surround it, I will be happy to speak to anybody about this process. And I would also like to thank the thousands of people who have helped in make this happen in the Weatherby area. So watch this space and let's hope we can actually get this through in the next few months. Thank you very much.
you, Linda, and thank you for the sun plug. Always appreciated. And our final panellist is Dr. Robin Price. Robin is the Director of Quality and Environment at Anglian Water, where he leads the company's Environmental Investment Programme, which I hope you'll be able to tell us more about now. Over to you, Robin. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Kitty, and can I just add my thanks as well to the, the Conservative Environment Network for giving us the opportunity to host this event. I think it's testament, the fact it's standing room only at the back, just the importance of this issue to all of us in the room. So thank you very much. Um, Anglian Water is geographically the largest uh, of the water companies in, in England and Wales. We, we start at the South Humber Bank and we go all the way to the, ta the, the, the Thames estuary uh, to around Anna's constituency. Uh, and our purpose as an organisation is, is to deliver environmental and social prosperity to the region that we serve through our commitment to love every drop. And that purpose is much more than words. We were the first water company to embed that purpose into our articles of association, which means that directors, we directors of the organisation, the decisions we make must align and must ensure that we are delivering to that purpose. So this is very, very important for us. Our role is absolutely to protect the environment from harm, and I'm unequivocal, and any other water company colleagues in the, in the room will also be unequivocal, it is completely unacceptable for any of our, act our activities or our operations to be causing environmental damage. So completely unacceptable, and our role is to, to protect the environment from that harm. But our role is not just to protect the environment, we've also got to restore and enhance the environment. And we are currently in this five-year period investing over £800 million doing just that through our Water Industry National Environment Programme. This is our largest, this is the industry's largest uh, investment programme, and this is, as I say, £800 million directly into making the environment a better place. And a quarter of this is being spent directly to reducing spills. Uh, and this was a plan that we were developing this time five years ago, back in 2017. So this isn't a reactionary plan in reaction to this. This is something we've been thinking about for, for many, 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 many years. So we were developing this plan, and a quarter of the plan is designed specifically to focus on this issue. We are investing in monitoring. Uh, Philip Dunn, you know, the, the, the monitoring, I absolutely agree that the monitoring, if we don't have the data, the information on which to base risk assessments on the basis to make decisions, then we, we are completely hamstrung so we absolutely welcome the monitoring and 100% of our monitors of our of our spill locations will be monitored next year we will be at 85% by Christmas of this year and that's two years ahead of the target set for us by the Environment Agency we're also investing in storm tanks we're investing in, in in better ways of kind of capturing all of the surface water which finds its way into our system collecting it and storing it and then putting it through treatment and we're also investing heavily in bathing waters and in sustainable urban drainage systems as well and this, this investment is working. We've seen our spills reduced by a third since 2018 when we kind of had a, a really decent amount of monitoring in place. And we have surrendered one-sixth of all of the permits for combined sewer overflows back to the regulator. So we are moving forward. We are, we are on a mission to, to remove these. And of course, uh, our, our environment program, our Water Industry National Environment, environment Program, is just one piece of a very large jigsaw in terms of environmental investment. It sits alongside our Water Resources Management Plan, where we are looking to protect the environment from over abstraction and build new, reduced demand for water and increase new supply side options. It sits alongside our Drainage and Wastewater Management Plan. It sits alongside our Net Zero commitments and our Capital Maintenance Program as well. But even that isn't enough. Uh, and in uh, March of this year, just six months ago, we were delighted to partner with our colleagues at Seven Trent Water to launch our Get River Positive campaign, which is where we've made five very ambitious but very tangible pledges to the environment for our regions. And these are absolutely focused on going even further and faster on reducing spills to make sure that our operations are not the reasons for rivers and streams to achieve, to not achieve good ecological status. But we need to focus on nutrients. We need to focus on flows. There are many, many factors, and all of these must be focused on. We are working with river groups across our region to create inland bathing waters. Again, you know, delighted to I'll be, I'll be looking at the toolkit as well. We're particularly working with the River Deben Association, who will be uh, submitting an application for a bathing water uh, designation at the end of this month to, into DEFRA. We're working with farmers and others whose activities can impact on river health. As, you, as I'm sure you're aware, the water industry is, is one, one player in a, in, a rich, in a rich tapestry, a very complex framework of organisations and sectors who have an impact on the environment, brought home to us by the EAC's report uh, earlier this year. So again, what we don't want to do is just sit and kind of throw statistics at others and say, oh, it's all about the farmers, it's all about highways. No, we've got it. You don't care. You just want us to show leadership as sectors, stand shoulder to shoulder and just sort the problem out. 
Uh, we're investing in catchments to support the, the, the restoration of catchments at landscape scale across chalk streams uh, in Norfolk, across we're introducing beavers in, in Essex as well, very, very you know, supporting the creation of new habitats. And most importantly, and Anna has absolutely hit the nail on the head, we've got to be much, much more open and transparent about our plans, our performance and the data we have. So you, all of us as river users, have the information that we need to make decisions. Um, and finally, I just wanted to, to say, just absolutely assure you, look, look you in the eye, the Conservative Environment Network, and say we are taking this very, very seriously, and we are in an organisation and a sector which is really on this. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. I guess, before we head over to questions, I just have a few points to pick up on, and then we can get your questions, because I'm sure there are many. Um, the first point, I think every panellist covered it in some way, is about the need for a more catchment-based approach to rivers. I know the government has done some things in the past to tackle this, but I wondered, representing different stakeholders here across the table, what we all might think would be a way the government could <coughs> approach this catchment-based solution. Go forward. Maybe, Philip, you have a few thoughts. Thank you. Well, I think the other feature of, uh, of our rivers in addition to the quality of the water, is the volume of water. And I'm sure many people in this room will be aware of rivers which this summer have run dry for the first time in living memory. I've certainly got uh, a stretch in my constituency. So I think we need to consider water management holistically, as you say, across catchments, looking at both supply and use, and therefore treatment. Um, and there's the, I mean, we are we are aware that the water industry are have had plans for a number of years to be able to transfer water resources from the areas of abundance to the areas of scarcity, and I, I would rate Anglian probably at the receiving end of this, um, and, and places like my area, uh, Seven Trent, you mentioned being at the generation side, uh, we tend to have more water. So I, I personally, I'm I'm very encouraged to see the new Secretary of State in his first day in post calling in the water company chief executives to have a meeting with them mostly focused on, on the treatment. Uh, but also drought was in the air at the time and, uh, and I think we need to be looking more holistically about uh, 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 how we manage our water resources for the future. Thank you, Philip. Um, another question picking up from what Anna said on wet wipes and the four Ps. Um, was around the issue of fatbergs, and so this is something that I think has picked up a lot of traction in Parliament and beyond. Um, but getting rid of plastic in wet wipes will not solve the problem of fatbergs, not least because it's in the name fat. Uh, so I thought perhaps, Robin, you could give some further details on how Anglin is tacking, tackling the fat in fatbergs. Yeah, ab absolutely. So the, 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 again, this is all about partnership working and, and kind of working with people. This isn't about kind of blaming people or, or, or kind of finding people. This is about working hand in hand, particularly with food service establishments. So we are, we've got a, a huge program of, of kind of, as well as kind of public campaigns about Christmas Day, don't put the turkey fat down the, down the sink, etc. but working with food service establishments and just working about kind of where waste oils and kind of waste fat grow, goes and how we can kind of recycle some of that, turn it into biofuel or something, you know, do something useful uh, with it. So a huge program. I mean, we, we spend tens of millions of pounds kind of flushing our network, cleansing our network to remove fat sores and greases and wet wipes. And that isn't, that's, that's dealing with the symptom. That's not dealing with the cause. So this is all about engagement. This is all about partnership work. And this is kind of just standing shoulder to shoulder, as I say, with organisations who could possibly kind of be, be the, the kind of the cause of kind of fat sores and greases finding their way down the sink, working with them, helping with them, helping them, support them, giving them information on which to act, uh, but then actually doing something useful with the oil as well. So it's not, you, you haven't just got a problem to be transported somewhere else. Perfect. Um, we'll now head over to audience questions. I'll be taking them in batches of three, and I'll try and do it in groups because we only have one roving mic. So I'll start at the front. Where is the roving mic? Uh, okay, James, come down to the front. We will go with the lady on the front row at the right. Please try and keep your questions as short as possible so we can get them around the room as quickly and make sure they are questions and not, in fact, statements. Thank you very much. I'm Councillor Onley Cubitt. I'm a borough councillor from Basingstoke. And I'd like the panel's view on the government changing the statutory obligation of uh, the water companies from always having to say the answer is yes. We in the council would like the water companies to tell the truth and not have to say yes. Second question, gentleman on the front row. Uh, Richard O'Connell, President of Tottenham's Conservatives. 
Um, with the pressure on the 300,000 houses a year being built, it's going to put more and more pressure on the Victorian uh, pipelines that we've got for disposing of the sewage. Would it be better to consider making self-contained uh, systems, basically, for how new housing estates with, like, biodisc, et cetera, so as we don't, it takes the pressure off of the um, old Victorian pipes and also um, might keep uh, any problems more local? Thank you. And the third question, Councillor from South End. Davidson from South and Dorsey City Council and South and West constituency. So what is the role of the, um, the water companies in the planning system and what is the relationship, and has it been mentioned, with the Environment Agency? <coughs> so where do your various roles finish and end? Perfect. So the first question on saying yes, I suppose, Robin, that naturally comes to you if that's okay. Yeah, so uh, if I could just make sure I understand the question, is that saying, saying yes to... Big planning applications. Big planning applications, thank you. That's what oh, I thought it was, yeah. Works. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it is. So we are not a statutory consultee. We are not a statutory consultee on planning decisions, and developers have an automatic right to connect to our, to our system. And that's a huge problem for us. And that is something we are, you know, we would love to see change through amendments to Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act, along with the banner, the ban, the banner wet wipes and things like that. So, um, yeah, I would welcome a kind of comments from, from government colleagues, but that is a huge, huge problem for us. Can I come in on the back of this? So, uh, I think it's th the same answer to all three of the questions, which are all about exactly as, as uh, has been said. Uh, water companies at the moment are statutory consultees to local plan reviews every five years. So they get that much visibility on what might or might not be built in an area. But we all know, particularly those of you on planning authorities, that you can get significant applications for hundreds of houses to be added to a system and the water company at the moment can't, uh, they can object, but that can be overruled by the council. They cannot receive any SIL money if the local authority says, are told we need to double the capacity of our treatment but we can't afford to do that because the only fee that the water company will get will be the connection fee, which effectively pays for the connection to the house rather than at the back end of the system. I'm proposing two amendments to the levelling up bill precisely to address that issue, to make water companies statutory consultees and to make them eligible to be recipients of SIL. Did anybody want to come in on Meg's question regarding the Environment Agency and the relationship with that? I know this is something that some Sen MPs have raised with me in the past as well, relating to bathing water. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, can I come in on this gentleman's question, which was about housing estates, to give a shout out to one of Sen's uh, brilliant ideas in their upcoming Water Manifesto, uh, which, is, which is going to be published shortly. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, we are not doing enough to make ourselves more resilient uh, when, it, when it comes to thinking about water use. And by 2050, we will need at least 3,300 3, million litres of additional water per day to meet demand. One of, the, uh, one of the ideas that Sen have had, which I think is very sensible, is that the government should mandate sustainable drainage in all new properties via Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act 2010 and set minimum water efficiency standards in the future home standards for the fitting of such taps, toilets, showers, etc., that, will, uh, that will use water far more efficiently. Uh, these, are, these are sensible, practical things that we need to do uh, as our population continues to expand and as uh, the need to build more houses continues uh, unabated. Yeah. Your mic, can I? Yes. Yeah, no, and uh, again, to the words from my mouth, absolutely sustainable urban drainage systems, you know, keep the surface water back at the development. At the moment, I talked about two, we're spending £200 million building storm tanks. So essentially that's us collecting every drop of surface water that wants to find its way into our, into our foul network. We are then gathering all of that, storing it in blooming great tanks right next door to the beach or the chalk stream or the sensitive piece of environment. This is not the answer for us to pour, build more concrete and, and just accept this capacity. We've got to keep the surface water back up in the system and 
sustainable urban drainage systems are the are the most most fantastic things to do and believe, and guess what we'd be happy we would love to adopt them so we will adopt them we will run them as water companies we will add them to our infrastructure and we will manage them so we, yeah we, we we can't wait for mandatory suds to come on all new developments i'll now go to the back right of the room um no i can't see any faces um Jane McBean, Councillor Jane McBean. Yay. Oh, that's impressive. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, Jane McBean, Buckinghamshire Council. So our chalk stream had 96 illegal discharges of sewage into it last year. We'd like to see measures expedited, please, to stop that. Um, Environment Agency, they're doing the best they can under great pressure, but they're no use whatsoever. Is it, are they still fit for purpose, or should their powers be devolved to local authorities who have the local knowledge and people on the ground to actually police this and enforce measures. And I, the lady in front of Jane. Um, hi, uh, I'm Rosalind Carter and I'm from Client Earth. Um, so the panel have quite rightly uh, talked about the issues of sewage, uh, uh, sewage um, discharge and storm overflows. Um, however, many of England's rivers are being polluted by nutrient pollution from agricultural sources. Um, the River Wye, for example, m as many of you will be aware, um, has huge amounts of phosphorus pollution, much of which comes from intensive agriculture. So I just want to know uh, what the panel think is the best way to tackle this, um, and particularly how we can improve monitoring and enforcement in this area. And third question from the man stood in the aisle. Hello, thank you very much. Um, Paul Bicknor, Aaron District Council, West, Sus West Sussex. Um, regarding uh, sewage uh, micro sewage systems, where, whenever possible, I get uh, contractors to, or developers to put in new sewage lines. This is quite effective for developments over 100 houses, but when you've got small developments of 50, 25, they're using micro sewage uh, systems. Like the board's opinion on whether they like micro sewage systems or not, or prefer things going to the mains. Personally, micro sewage systems, I believe, are a nightmare for the future. Thank you. Okay, so the first question was on chalk streams specifically and also whether or not the EA should become devolved to local authorities. Anybody would like to come in? I'll, I'll have a go at that. So um, the office, we have as a result of uh, leaving the EU, a new environmental regulator called the Office of Environmental Protection. And the, uh, the chairman, Glenis Stacey, Dame Glenis Stacey, has decided that uh, she will look at the regulatory environment surrounding water, um, partly as a result of some nodding, uh, nudging from our committee. Uh, and we are expecting her uh, to pronounce on whether she thinks the regulatory regime is doing its job properly uh, in the coming months. At the same time, the EA is taking, I think, six now, Robin, water companies um, uh, through an investigative process into the way in which they have been uh, either legally or illegally discharging sewage into our water systems. So there are two sort of parallel strands of activity going on, uh, effectively coming to the same point, which is, is the EA doing its job properly or not? Uh, and I'm going to reserve judgment until I see the outcome of those uh, investigations. Uh, but I think there has to be a question mark as to whether or not uh, the EA uh, have taken their eye off this ball for too long. Um, how do we put it? back into focus. Absolutely. I wonder, Linda, if you'd like to come in. H have you been involved with the EA while on... I was just going to say, yes. I mean, uh, my dealings with the EA in terms of the bathing water application is that they, there is uh, a perceived willingness to support this. Um, and there is always the um, idea that they're not in a position to do so because they don't have the sufficient regulatory uh, teeth to be able to do this. Neither, and I think it's been already recognised, they do not have sufficient staff to be able to actually go where they need to go on the number of times that they need to go there to prove the point that these are actually indeed um, discharges which shouldn't be happening. So I think we're back to the same thing. It's not one particular element that is going to actually address it. It's a number of those which will work together to actually support and create the information and actually get some mechanisms in place which will do the job and reduce the discharges and make sure that the water is as it should be. 
Anna, would you like yeah. to come? Yeah, um, I just want to give another a shout out here to Sen, because one of the things that Sen has been campaigning for, quite rightly, uh, is us to scrap the cap on civil sanctions for waters, for polluting water companies. And yesterday, uh, we saw a very positive announcement from the new Secretary of State, in which he, in which he has now uh, stated his commitment to raise that cap from 250,000 to 250 million pounds uh, when water companies are found to be polluting. And that is absolutely necessary. There is no point, a lot of money being spent uh, pursuing civil or criminal proceedings if, in fact, proper fines are not imposed, because otherwise it becomes a commercial decision for the water companies. And just to give you some facts, between 2015 and 2021, the Environment Agency issued 68 civil sanctions with an average fine of £152,000. Um, that is completely inadequate for the scale of the problem. Uh, so well done to Sen for keeping the, the pressure up and, and, you know, frankly, well done to the Secretary of State for making that one of his very first announcements. Absolutely. Um, and then the second question by Rosen was around the role of agriculture and nutrient pollution on this issue. Can you cover that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so whilst we are the, the kind of we are very focused on reducing sewer sort of spills and, and kind of focused on that, we can't forget that the vast majority of the reasons why rivers don't reach good ecological status is because of nutrients and also because of flow, uh, because of kind of river morphology changes or, or abstraction. So what I what I'd urge us to do is 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 not lose sight of that and, and continue the work that we're doing there. So let's not let's keep moving forward on on spills, but let's not forget nutrients and flow. And again, I think Philip hit the nail on the head. We're not going to we're not going to solve issues like this if we if we sit as the water industry over here and farmers sit over there and drought people talk about something over here water quality people flooding people we've got to join this up and take a much more place-based approach now whether that place is is a catchment is a county it doesn't matter kind of thing but it's about finding the right unit where you have all of the actors in place who can make some decisions can move at speed speed and can provide investment to solve problems at, at a much more place-based approach so um partnership working and yeah I'm a huge fan of the catch and based approach absolutely but the, you know again counties you know linking to local nature recovery lo local nature recovery strategies all of the things coming through the environment act around biodiversity net gain are just game changing pieces of legislation that really drive opportunities for farmers to deliver environmental good and again we'd like to stand shoulder to shoulder with them thank you robin and i wondered if you'd like to give any thoughts to paul's question on micro sewage system I think absolutely. I, I don't know a lot about micro sewage systems, but I think I'd, I think it's much more sensible to try and connect everything into the main sewage system and then hand it over to us and we'll deal with it. Fantastic. So the next round of questions, I'll go from to the back left. Uh, the gentleman with the beard just on the end of the row. David Abbott, Skegness, a coastal community, not the end of an estuary, but does have a sewage outlet. Uh, I completely agree about wet wipes, uh, but I think a ban would have a fair lead time to, for manufacturers to change their processes. To me, a simpler and more immediate uh, remedy would be to introduce regulations similar to those on cigarette packets and to require all wet wipe boxes to have a wa warning that these are not flushable and, sh and are a danger to the environment. And I wonder whether there's meat on that that their MPs might consider. Um, the gentleman behind him. Hello, um, Oliver from uh, the Conservative Friends of the Ocean and also proud Devonian as well. Um, the Devon and South West Water have long had, uh, with all our surfing beaches, there are lots of um, news, uh, there's news about how the CSOs are really affecting coastal communities. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the four Ps, which is fantastic. And I, we had a, a meeting with Southwest Water. They only said three Ps, so you <laughs> added puke to the end of it, which I like. Um, they did a study that there's only 8% of bathrooms have bins in them. Mm -hmm. And it's because people, they don't have a bin, so they throw it down the toilet instead. So yeah. something as simple as that, um, uh, introducing bins at somewhere for people to put the stuff instead. But uh, the, kind of the question I wanted to ask, sorry, um, was about um, coastal bathing and things like that and the communication between the EA, between companies like Southwest Water and the District Council 
who put up signs saying there's a pollution, there's a pollution risk warning, there's no technically any spill, but they say no bathing. And it means businesses who are water sports businesses then lose out business and there's no compensation for them. But it's a communications issue that um, needs to be addressed. And a third question, the gentleman stood up on the left-hand side with the very funky shirt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Bruce Buckland from Northwest Hampshire. I'm also a member of British Canoeing's River Access Advisory Group. Um, there's been a lot of talk of uh, users and river users from various aspects, whether that's swimmers, paddle boarders, anglers, um, and people obviously extracting. Um, in a lot of places, in fact, in 96% of the country, uh, access is contested um, legally. There's no, there's a grey area of law that's existed for decades, uh, which has not yet been resolved. Um, can I encourage and, off and ask the thoughts of my parliamentary members of the panel about extending the countryside rights of way uh, access land to rivers, uh, or implementing a public access? Uh, public right of navigation on rivers so that people can get access to the rivers that they deserve. Thank you. So the first question from the best place in the UK, because I'm also from there, Skegness, on the issue of wet wipes. And I'll hand this over to Anna to give yet another plug to the Sen Manifesto. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Easy answer to that gentleman's question. It's a great idea. Uh, thank you very much for raising it. You're, you're absolutely right. There is a bill going through uh, uh, Parliament at the moment, or being introduced um, to Parliament, called the Plastics Wet Wipes uh, Bill, uh, which is calling for a ban uh, uh, on the use of plastics in wet wipes, but we, which is a good thing, of course, but we need to go far further than that, because even things that are biodegradable are not necessarily flushable. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. We need a far clearer labelling system. Uh, and this is, again, something which the Seine Rivers Manifesto is calling for and which I fully support. So we want, to, we want to avoid people putting wet wipes and sanitary products and nappies and, and anything else that isn't one of the four uh, Ps um, that I mentioned earlier going down, down the, down the uh, toilet. So, yes, we've got to have a much clearer uh, labelling system. And over time... I would suggest that we do need to ban these um, these products from being you know, flushed down the loo uh, um, at all. But to, I think we should start by trusting that people want to clean up their water, um, they want to do their bit, and and change and have a change of behaviour piece. And the thing about about uh, bins in the in the bathroom again, an, another brilliant point. You know, we need to get some of these common sense points across with some good advertising campaigns. It's been done before to change behaviour. Uh, look at look at the the, uh, the smoking, the success with the the smoking campaign. Uh, things as simple as that uh, need to be done. And the comms point is absolutely right. Um, uh, it, it's uh, uh, at the moment we have the worst of all worlds because we have this information uh, coming out from campaign groups about the number of spills and their duration but nothing about the content of the spills and uh, and not all of the time but certainly a significant amount of the time the content isn't bad enough to make the 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 water unsafe for swimming and yet nobody knows that and this is a basic piece of communication that i'm afraid the water companies have got to up their their game on did you want to come uh, just very briefly, I think Anna's quite right to talk about behavioural change. I mean, much of the challenges that we have as human beings and the impact we have on the environment comes down to our behaviour. If we can change our behaviour, we can improve the environment. I've just been in Albania and Greece, where you're not allowed to put uh, loo paper down the loo because of the problems it poses to their pipes. If any of you ever go on a boat, go on a cruise, you're not allowed to put paper down the loo. And the reason you're not allowed to put paper down the loo is not because of, it's got, because of the paper, it's because loo paper contains glue. How many people knew that in this room? I didn't know that until I started on this journey. There are 2.7 grams of glue in every roll of loo paper, and that's what gums up the pipes in boats, which is why you're not allowed to put the loo paper down the loo. So behavioural change, I think the idea of putting a label on what wet wipes to say, don't, this is not a flushable product, is an absolutely brilliant idea. And just finally, while I've got the microphone, on access 
to, to the waterways. I think this is a, quite a tricky area. Uh, it's an, uh, tricky because of the, the risk attached in, in uh, accessing uh, our waterways. And if riparian owners become liable for accidents, you know, regrettably people do drown in, our, in rivers and lakes in this country. Um, and you've got a big issue there about how you allow access in a manner that is uh, not going to impose huge obligations on people who might become responsible. So I think it's, it's in certain places we should be encouraging it, but I, I think a general right to, to roam and navigability is a real problem. Linda, did you want to come Yeah, in? I did. Just go on the back of the two things. I have a Ukrainian visitor staying with me at the moment, and she was astonished. It was one of our first non-English conversations via the translator about why there wasn't a bin in the toilet and what we're going to do with this. So yes, I have been educated about the fact that what we expect as normal isn't necessarily normal everywhere else. And maybe our accessing with that would be good. The second point I would say was that uh, in terms of riparian owners, again, I've got a meeting with uh, such as one uh, next week because he is concerned about that. Because again, the you know, sledgehammer of the bathing water status application means that he is fearful that he will become liable. He is fearful that that will obviously be a difficulty for him. And it is about rights of access and it is all of those things. So I do think we need to look at these things a little more honestly and not necessarily put as much onus in some ways as on others. So. Oh, sure, sure. Just, just really wanted to cover your, your colleague from Devon around the, the pollution risk forecast. So these, these kind of alerts and alarms that kind of go off and sound, even when there haven't, hasn't actually been a spill at all. So this is kind of based on an uh, environment agency algorithm. So again, we just urge, you know, call for a, an urgent review, particularly to protect coastal communities who may use tourism industry may be damaged by this when there actually has, hasn't been a spill of sewage or anything particularly there. So, yeah. Chris. <laughs> okay, I'm being told to go for these three over here. You've been waiting a long time, you're being rewarded. <laughs> these three. <laughs> Hello. Hi, uh, my name is, I'm a doctor, and I can tell you something, the hygienic uh, things in this country have changed. A lot of doctors are telling the patients to use wet pipes and all. Because, uh, you know, we need something like when you go to France or Italy, we have a bidet system, you know, people wash and then come. In this country, the WCs have to be changed and only you people can change it because people are cleaning themselves much better than before. If you see the Bristol stool chart, which goes from solid to liquid, people are eating curries. You won't be able to have the same kind of poo which you had in 50s. So they need to clean themselves. That is the reason why people are using wet wipes. You should have, one should know why they are using it. The reason is we've been telling them in hospitals, use it, you know, something has to change. Japanese style music, to add it to the WCs. <laughs> the small peas are becoming quite the theme today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Neil from Bexhill. We recently had a pumping station failure and it attracted national headlines with a sewage spill. However, um, a different type really. I've had a lot of enthusiasm for regulation and for f investment and for fining water companies. But what kind of extra cost are you expecting consumers Sorry, what kind of extra cost should we expect consumers to pay? Uh, thank you. Uh, Robert Smart from, from Eastbourne. So first of all, let me congratulate you, Anna, in putting coastal communities right to the top of the list. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, 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 admirable programme from SEN, but I'm surprised that the IDBs are not involved at all. Uh, they in my view, they've been sold a pup by the Environment Agency. I sit on an IDB, which is the Pevensey and Cookmere Management Level Board, and that leads into a wholly related issue that only Robin mentioned, which is flooding. Flooding is, is poss possibly the biggest issue in this whole situation. I'm sorry, rivers is, is perhaps you know, is, you know, a small part of that. Um, and finally, just to the qu one of the questions from the back, in terms of the question in terms of the Environment Agency, my dealing with the Environment Agency absolutely say it's not fit for purpose. It takes forever to get anything done. Um, so to ask a question, if we're going to address the problem of sewage at, at its core, do we have a view in terms of what the overall costs are and how reasonably they might be addressed to get to a sensible stage? Did anybody want to come on, on the topic of medicine and hygiene and wet wipes? 
Well, as a former health minister, uh, I, I absolutely get the point you're making, sir, about the, the need not to discourage people from, uh, from cleanliness. It's very, very important. I think the, the counterpoint to that is that they should be told when using wet wipes for cleanliness to put it in the bin, not down the loo. Uh, and that really goes back to the point that was made earlier about signage. On cost, the two questions about cost. So, yes, it will cost money to solve this problem, but it is affordable. And the evidence for this is the Tideway Tunnel. The Tideway Tunnel is taking 37 million out of 39 million tonnes of sewage currently spilt in, deliberately spilt into the Thames by Thames Water out by building an enormous tunnel which will receive, I think it's 21 separate um, uh, main sewers from both north and south of the River Thames uh, into a new tunnel being built underneath the river. It's four double-decker buses next to each other in size. Um, this is going to cost uh, four point, I think it's 4.6 billion pounds to get operational. It was originally conceived in 2007, got planning permission in 2014, will become operational, if everything goes to pl current plan, which it is, in 2025. So it will be 11 years from starting the construction to completing it, making it operational. 4.8 billion sounds an enormous amount of money, and it is. It will be paid for by a £20 per household annual addition to the bill for Londoners. £20 a year to take, 37, to take the sewage out of the Thames doesn't seem to me to be unaffordable. And did anyone want to have some very brief comments on the issue of flooding? Uh, uh, just very, very briefly, just if I may, just quickly on costs and I'll come to flooding. I think, I think the really important thing to remember here is that costs don't have to be all borne by the water company and uh, borne through our water bills. So, you know, if we are paying for mandatory sustainable urban drainage systems and paying that through developer through, through the cost of new houses, if we are using ELMS, environmental land management schemes, effectively to deliver to pay farmers to deliver ecosystem services, to land la uh, to. Uh, flooding, water quality and water quant quantity. If we're keeping surface water out through, you know, all houses having a water butt, you know, something as simple as a water butt on the side of the house, keeping that, all of the water that's kind of gushing off of, dry, off of roofs. Um, if we're investing in highways, drains and things, all of these are, are, are kind of compounding factors and not all of those are kind of within the gift of the water company to solve or necessarily have to be paid through by all of us through our water bills. But we as society have got to pay for them. But if we work together in a place-based approach, in partnership approach, then the overall cost, I firmly, firmly believe, will be less per citizen. Thank you. And on the d flooding, yeah, absolutely crikey. Come to East Anglia. We have IDBs everywhere, and we are very proud to work in partnership with our drainage boards. The work they do to convey flood water, to store water in times of drought, to convey water in times of flood as well is, is astonishing. And, yeah, all power to, to IDBs. Right, OK. OK, yes, yeah, the Water Management Alliance, absolutely. I know them well. Yeah, the, the only thing I wanted to add on this issue of cost is that these uh, amounts that companies are fined, that should be hypothecated, and those fines should go straight back into these sort of public health campaigns and cleaning up our, our rivers uh, and our waters, as we've been talking about. Perfect. I'm Thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you all so much for joining us. If you enjoyed SEN as a concept and want to find out more about, for example, the SEN River Manifesto, I encourage you all to sign up as a supporter or a SEN counsellor, which is free to do on our website or by heading to our store. If you've enjoyed this event, I encourage you to stick around for the next one, which is in half an hour on the topic of if electric vehicles are actually good for the environment. Thank you all so much, and thank you to our sponsor, Anglian Water. <laughs>